Welcome everyone for our talk. Um, first of all, I would like to say sorry. We like these colors better. <laughs> That's why we wanted to use these layouts. So um, we're going to talk about some uh, UX practices and how we blend these with GitOps and how we can achieve great DevX together. But first, let's get to know each other. So welcome, everyone. My name is Anjas Dimitri. I'm based in Barcelona, and I work as a UX designer in the Open Innovation Lab Senior Team in Red Hat. Yeah. And my name is Jan Su. I'm a Startup Liability Engineer in Open Innovation Labs team in Red Hat. And today, I'm sorry, I've seen really great some techie talks before us, like a bunch of YAML files and a bunch of tech, tech tools. But this is not a techie talk, techie talk, so I wanted to give a disclaimer. Maybe I can show you one YAML file. I'm not sure. I don't exactly remember. But just wanted to set the scene. And this is what we're going to actually talk for the next 20 -ish minutes. So we want to talk about how UX and GitOps can actually work together by um, some myths that we've been observing with our customers. And uh, we have this thing called show not tell. We're going to also um, share a customer experience and uh, a recent engagement that we've completed with this topic. And also, we wanted to touch a little bit of platform as a product concept that we really seen it's, uh, it's getting really increased um, interest uh, in, the, in, the, um, in this ecosystem. So, let's debunk some myths before. Let's Myth number start. one. Yeah. So, UX is only about pretty things. How many times we've heard this sentence? Next slide, please. But first of all, I want you to ask, uh, raise your hand if you know what a UX designer does. Huh? OK. Nice. Keep your hand raised if you've worked uh, once with uh, UX. OK, a few hands on. And also, keep or raise your hand if you know how to explain what the UX designer does. Okay. Oh, nice. Let's see someone. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Then I will ask you later on. Next slide, please. So I like to explain this kind of a story to understand what's more about the user experience design. So think about the worst thing of staying in a hotel. I have a friend of mine who used to travel a lot because of work. And he was staying at the hotels. And every time he came back, he was complaining about, I don't know, the bed, the breakfast, the service, whatever it was. And one day, uh, it was very funny because he came to us and he said, you won't believe what happened. Someone brought him a pillow menu. It was in front of him with the receptionist. And he was like, OK, what's this? And the receptionist said, OK, you can choose with whatever pillow you want to try. We would just bring it to the hotel room. You can try them, and then you can bring the rest to us if you don't want them. So at the end, he had such a nice experience that he, also, he always remembered that hotel. He always will explain that story. Yeah, no, just Sorry. <laughs> you can continue. So at the end, this is a kind of uh, the Lean UX uh, loop that we use. It's about the thing make check. And also in here, you can see uh, it's a kind of a hypothesis statement that I did for this. So at the end, they started to see that uh, it was a bad reviews about the hotel, they were not happy. So maybe because of that, they started to do a kind of a research with qualitative and quantitative data. Um, they proposed this solution and then proposed it to the business. It was good. It was great. They had the budget. At the end, they check it with the, with the user. They test it. And they saw it was better. Maybe for the next time, they will have the pillows in the room. Oh, Who knows? Yeah, really, yeah. So at the end, a UX designer helps to make the best decisions for the users for the team, and also for the product. Okay. So, myth number two. Creating an amazing developer experience requires all these fancy UI and a big team that needs to support them. Like this kind of uh, consoles that you've been all seeing in, um, I don't know, AWS, Google Cloud, think about it. When we work with our customers, when we talk about developer portal or developer experience, they all think about these examples, these hyperscaler examples, and they think that, like, they need a lot of time to build something like this. But actually, the reality is that what is important is that you need to this. First of all, who has ever seen a Mobius loop before in here? Perfect. But if you want to know more, just come and find us. Um, that's a, this is our navigator in all our engagements. And the whole point is that it helps you to balance the discovery and the delivery work. And it's, the, it's important that what you uh, you need to discover just enough to identify your developer's pain point, identify what they can help you, and then deliver it, and then go over the loop to test with them to see what you discovered, what you delivered is really addressing their problem. 
And that's really important to balance work. You don't really go to a big bank building a cathedral while you need a home, like a simple house. And it's really important to balance this work with the right foundation, like cultural foundation, and the right engineering practices, such as GitOps. And myth, myth number three. three. So when building the platform, we know our users' needs, and we don't need to talk to them. So most of the time, we see yeah. the next slide. So we think if uh, we build it, they will come. We will wait that they will put their applications on and they will deploy everything in the platform. But the reality is that's not what happens. Like um, it's two weeks ago, I was in Brussels talking with a customer, and there was this platform engineer was saying that oh, we've been focusing on this build in this great platform for developers, but they're just not coming and just like deploying their application. And then I was talking with developers, and they were saying, oh yeah, we are waiting for the uh, platform to be ready for us so that I can deploy it, but they were not talking to each other, it's just because they don't know what they, uh, what they expect from each other. So it's uh, when you have such sort of like not talking with your end users, even though they are internal users, you got this empty cluster, plat uh, empty cluster problem, what we call, they just don't come, they don't come. So you might think that, yeah, yeah, that sounds familiar, this kind of thing, so what you guys are suggesting? So. What we suggest is, welcome to the Club Angels. Thank you. Yay. <laughs> so we, uh, what we suggest yes. is we say, plant your UX, um, UX designer with your developers and treat your platforms as a product. So what we mean in that, actually, so if you think about these um, classical cloud native organizations, we have these classical um, three layers, infrastructure layers, platform layer, and application layer. And what we've seen in our customers generally is that they've been, uh, in platform engineering layers, we've seen these like a keep increasing um, a cognitive load. Because previously, if you think that like, you write your Java code, package it up and throw over some wall, and then someone else has tested it, someone else has run it, operated it uh, in the different environments. But now we have this, um, with the cloud native approach, we say this like engineers should be like T-shaped. It has some sort of uh, depth knowledge of some topic and a breadth of uh, knowledge, a couple of knowledge so that they can build their thing, they can own their thing, they can run their thing. But what we've seen in the reality actually, we sort of created this rectangular shape engineers like, um, what we call these like mythical, mystical unicorn type of engineers. We expect them to do everything at, the, at that moment in the, in the enough depth of knowledge to run their thing, test their things, um, apply, uh, create, like build their thing in the production and etc. And that creates a huge cognitive load for them. That creates the eventually leads some sort of burnout type of feeling. So what we are uh, suggesting is that when it comes to platform is that like um, creating some uh, services to take those kind of load from developers, but not taking the responsibilities, but delivering some sort of capabilities, delivering some sort of services for them to help they have to do their work. Um, and the way that we actually address this, um, has anyone read team topologies in here, or DevOps topologies, which is the old word? That's, that's a great book that we highly suggested. We can totally advocate about this book. So this book is um, talking about the um, separation of um, concerns and how you can organize your teams uh, for this cloud native of development methodology. And it has some sort of great team types. And as Red Hat, we usually work like an enabling teams for the customers, so we help them to enable, uh, enable the, our customers with our technology, with our UX practices and all. And the problem we are trying to solve in here, actually, creating the right platform to fit for purpose. So that it can be like, it can be a great platform for developers that they can't resist and they just come and use it. So we are, uh, what we are trying to focus is building the um, capabilities like, um, let's say, site reliability engineering or helping them to practice their own GitOps way. They, because you've been seeing a bunch of dif different GitOps tools during the day. You've seen a bunch of dif different ways to apply these, different tools like customize, Helm, et cetera. What we want developers to, they want, we want them to enable with this uh, approach and we want them to practice this approach. And while doing it, we don't want them to uh, rediscover the world again. So if you can provide those services, like um, let's say observability as a service, logging as a service, data as a service, you take that load from them and you help them to actually focus on what is important, which is the business, um, business, uh, business problem what they're trying to solve. 
So what we are trying to do actually in here is to apply a product mindset. And this might sound quite fluffy and it can be confusing. But there's the next slide mm. about the, this uh, Venn diagram that we use while describing what's a product and which uh, phases or which things uh, it has to have in balance. So in here you can see that it has to be desirable. It has to build the product that customers want. It has to be viable. It has uh, to be built the right thing. And at the end, it has to be feasible. It has to be the thing right. So at the end, if you mix all of these uh, three aspects together, at the very middle of it, you can find this uh, sweet pot, which is the th thinnest viable product I platform. Sorry. <laughs> thinnest viable platform. That's the most important thing in here. Because um, your platform doesn't have to be all this fancy UI or anything. It just can be a YAML file, which we've been delivering this, uh, which, uh, which, which we've been using this as a starting point for our customers for two, uh, for last year, and we also actually deliver a talk, technical talk, how we apply, uh, implement this with a um, leading airline company, uh, let's say this like that. So we always use, um, we start with GitOps, um, we put a GitOps approach to how to onboard the applications, how to onboard the teams, and have some sort of scaffolding in the behind. So it doesn't have to be a fancy UI, because your developers are already interacting with Git. You already interacting with Git. So why not start from there? Why not leverage the GitOps practices? Why not leverage the benefit of GitOps? in order to onboard your applications or upload, uh, onboard the new people. So, you might think, okay, I don't believe you, but continue. This is what we call show not tell. So, um, last winter actually, we were in up, up north, right below the Arctic Circle in a Norwegian, uh, we were working with this Norwegian company. Uh, it's a highly regulated company and they wanted to build a state-of-the-art platform in order to, um, in order to have, uh, improve their developer experience, improve their uh, time to market. Um, so they engage with us and they have different type of developers. So there are not, the, not all the developers are the same. So they have these developers that are um, looking for just take the problem away from me, just give me the bits so that I can do my job. But they have also some sort of creative developers, but that's what we call them. Like they want to innovate, they want to experiment with the new tools, they want some space, they want some more responsibility. So the company was looking to address a platform to work with both of them. So just to set the scene, this is their, um, let's say, the old uh, CI-CD pipeline. So it was like a black box for the developers. They were just um, pushing their codes and hoping that it would, um, it would deploy somewhere. Actually, their UX designer um, did a great analogy for this while they were introducing us on their um, current state. The UX designer said that it is like a water slide in the pool, like the developers putting their child and hoping that they would come out. But they, they don't know if it's gonna come out or not. And when it does not come out, they have no idea why, because they didn't have any visibility. They and didn't have any transparency for the platform. And I wonder when they would ask for help, in a sense, how many tiles they would throw, maybe 16, 17? 16 and they, hey, there's no one coming out. My tiles are not coming out. <laughs> yeah, so what we did is, we also did the platform as a product workshop, which is a workshop that uh, we develop its uh, half day. And in here we set the scene because it's a quite a new concept. So we were discussing together with the customer uh, what's a platform, what's a product for them, how all of this can get together. And also, actually here you can see the Venn diagram that I just showed. And it was uh, very important for us to get that alignment before starting to build the platform. And um, this is one of the practices that we use. It is called event storming, coming from domain-driven design. So the company's um, ambition was to create such platform, like have a high trust in the platform that even the one person that uh, it starts in the uh, like it first day in the in their company, they can deploy to the production. So this is um, you always set a scenario in event storming, and that was our scenario, like the one where Mary deploys the production on her first day. So what we did in here, we identify what, what sort of pain points, uh, what sort of things that developers need in order to um, achieve this, and how we envision for developers to interact with the platform. So there are a couple of questions that we identify while discussing with developers and the platform people and the business people in the same room. And one of the points was like, okay, developers need a sandbox. And at the, that moment, they didn't have any sandbox environment. So they were working locally, and the cluster was some other story completely. Or like, um, 
how can uh, what sort of branching uh, strategy they should have or uh, every developer has their own way of doing things which is fine what should we address in the platform so in here you can see what we did spring by spring in a kind of a research perspective um, as Chansu was saying previously, um, they wanted this kind of uh, sandbox or dev environment, but uh, we didn't know what it was about, what it has to have inside, how it was uh, developed, why do they want it, or how would they use it. So it was uh, quite interesting because after that, I think we just point down the project and the whole journey mm -hmm. of it. Uh, after that, we also took in consideration about uh, the onboarding uh, research how it has to be all the stuff uh, provided to the developer, which is the best experience for them, um, things like that. Uh, then we also simplified the, like the visualization of the overall process. I mean, in a sense that uh, we saw the architecture, it was very complex with a lot of technologies, but we also needed, uh, from the business perspective, to be consumable. So we also simplified that. And by the end, we organize the documentation in a sense how it has to be organized, which kind of information uh, the devs expect out of it, also in sections, maybe in kind of in uh, architectural information, I would say. And this is what we did. And just to give you a kind of a UX toolkit, I won't talk about uh, any of these uh, practices. I just want to point them out and to highlight again the thing phase which is about the research in where we really talk with the user, we empathize with them, and we really, we really see the pain points in there. Then we move into the make phase in where we synthesize all the information that we have from the uh, previous phase, and we also prototype or make some kind of process or something that we really need, we, we really can put uh, the hands to the, to the user. And at the end, of course, we, we check and we test it. At the end, what we want to all of this process is bring the developers to the platform team room together. So they work together and really, re, they really gather the feedback that really needed for the platform. Also, this is a final live document. It's a kind of a user journey, service blueprint, but in where um, we mapped uh, all the pain points, all the documentation tasks, all the touch points, and also the users in here. And as you can see here, the metrics, it's empty, because as I said, it's something that it's live. And afterwards, uh, the customer and together with the platform, the users and the uh, developers, they uh, define. So it's something that uh, it helps us to visualize all together in which steps we are, in where we can uh, work, and so we can, we don't mix things. Mm -hmm. And all this work that and our UX designers, angels, and the company's own UX designers did, we always were like feeding the platform backlog with their feedback. With, um, basically, what we're doing is actually, we were keep watching them in, in action, like um, Angels did this great focus group discussion for the sandbox to identify how they would like to access a sandbox, how they, what sort of things that they need in a sandbox, how they would like to achieve this information to get that sandbox. So we were just building these things and I'm going to the developers, building these things, and going to the developers and testing, testing with them. And like, <laughs> that's me creeping over the shoulder of a developer to see how he's really using it. It's like it's the same as we discussed, as we envisioned, and getting their feedback. If they are like looking for something, like it takes time for them to find something, then we were taking notes. To, okay, we need to simplify this. We were mocking some stuff and going back to them. So that's that's the most important thing. You need to bring the users to the development phase. You don't have to really build a fancy UI or anything. Or or you don't have to like, like dictate a GitOps way of working or a tool for them. They, they are good enough to work this. It's just you need to simplify the process for them. So for, the, for that, what we were doing as platform team, we were providing some Lego bricks to them. We created a um, hand chart library within the company, for example. We were developing some mostly uh, most used hand chart, let's say, but putting out there. And they were automatically um, syncing to the cluster because of the, um, the, our GitOps controller, let's say. And we were, uh, we were using Tekton. Uh, if you are familiar with, Tekton has this notion of um, cluster tasks, which is cluster, uh, uh, cluster-wide available tasks. So we were creating some cluster-wide tasks that we know that every developer would need. Like let's say cloning the Git or con container containerization or I don't know, like running some sort of uh, Helm package, Helm lint task. So we were putting, uh, creating this kind of tasks openly in a Git repository and we were syncing those kind of changes, whatever is the new task is coming, through GitOps on the cluster and developers were looking at this open, like they, they can see it easily, they can come, okay, I need this. So they were getting this from library, 
but they can also bring their own tasks in their own namespaces, whatever they need, because they are the one who knows how to, um, how to build their application. If they need a secret or like if they want to mount a secret as an environment variable or if they need to mount a um, config map as a, as a persistent volume type of thing, it's, it's totally, totally up to them. It's just you give them some Lego bricks, some sort of leading um, like starting point, and they can easily see this. And the good point is they are contribute back. Like, if they create a new task and they see that it works for them, they will bring it back to the library for the wider user. So this is an example of these cluster tasks that we created. We were annotating them, and we were have some sort of versioning system. Um, just a screenshot from a cluster. So we were creating this for them. And if this is not working for them, they, don't, they just don't wait for anyone. They create their own tasks. So as, a, as an example for the final results, it was transparent for them. They were empowered how to onboard their applications, how to run their pipelines, how to, what sort of stages they should have in their pipeline. It was obvious to them, so it was, they were easily see if there is a problem. They were easily know what should improve, or because of these kind of interviews or the feedback loops, they were more confident to come to the platform team. Like they were easily to, uh, they knew how to communicate with the platform team, so they were speaking the same language. So at the that. end, some key takeaways after yes. this. Um, it's all about feedback loops. As uh, Chan Su was saying, it's very important to keep all of this process all together. And also, what I want to point out of this is that uh, we also need to keep them short. So uh, it's, it doesn't make sense, for example, if you have an idea now today and you want to make it real, I don't know, in one year and a half, too, after the business plan, after you took an MBA, after all of that stuff, because maybe then it will be late. So also what we recommend is to keep this feedback loop short and also fail fast and really learn from the overall process. And as I said, share tools really help them to share the, um, speak the same language. Like Git is the biggest shared tool in the moment in the ecosystem between them and Ops. When they were both interacting with Git, when they were identifying their own things, own um, tools or the objects as YAML files or or just uh, some sort of plain text files, it's really helped them to um, facilitate the conversation easily. Like Git's, GitOps itself really helped us a lot in this kind of, in this, um, in this, because before that, a couple of years ago, I didn't even see the usage of Git in the ops teams. There, it's just, just some sort of Ansible files sitting in some sort of folders inside a may, uh, common, um, I said, the, uh, common server like of developers use. So it's the same for the, like going, going the same for observability tools or the logging tools. When their tools are um, becoming more common and common, it really helped them to speak the same language and uh, create that feedback loops easily. And again, it's all about empowering devs to own their thing, and it's all about bringing their knowledge, bringing their um, newly, let's say, the newly created things, newly experienced thing to the platform. So platform is not something that now uh, a platform team or a couple of people building on the side, it is something that is uh, evolving constantly with the developer's feedback, with their input, with we say, hashtag never done. Because it's a product, it needs to get uh, evolved over time, it needs to, it can't keep the same, because uh, if you think about a product, um, product uh, spec like if you think about a product, it needs to be like, uh, it needs to solve a problem, and it needs to evolve over time. Otherwise, you will stop using it if it doesn't really um, address your problems anymore because your problems also change. So it's all about empowering. It's all about encouraging devs to bring this knowledge back. And it's all about keeping that feedback loop all the time alive. So thank you so much for so listening much for to us. us. And <laughs> um, I don't know. So, we are around if you would like to talk about this or the more UX practices, how we did this in, tech, uh, in the tech side, or I don't know, Mobius Loop, team topologies, anything if you would like to talk. We are here the We are here, or you day, can reach so us. You can see us around. Place. Yes. And thank, thank you. you so much. Any, any questions, yeah. by the way? I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Any questions? <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, um, we've got for the next talk, so we've left some room for questions. I'll pass Perfect. one over. Oops. Okay. <laughs> so uh, thank you for the talk.
I was going to ask, do you think that it's different to work with UX when you're building platforms for productivity, or do you think it's very similar to building any software product in general? What do you think? Oh, uh, yeah, because I'm a UX designer, <laughs> therefore. <laughs> it, it was honestly the same it's for me, because it's all about what the end user thinks, what the end user feels, what their pain points, what sort of improvement points that we can get from the users. It was the same, honestly. Like, um, Angels, were do, uh, Angels was doing the interviews with the users, and we were on the site taking this kind of notes. It was just like the same that a user using the app. It's just the different, like, um, if you don't see it, uh, user using a, using a phone to interact with. It was using the keyboard and uh, interacting with your documentation that you create, the Git, uh, the Git repos that you created. So it's feel is the same. The outcome is just the um, tools are different. But the way that we were doing it was, I think it was the same. Yeah, anything you want to add? Yeah? No, OK. No. <laughs> okay. Oh, sorry. A few more questions. Oh, I see two folks on the queue. Yes, hmm? we love oh, there. Um, so let's say I have a slight uh, empty cluster problem. What's like the best first feedback step that I can um, do to get started on the whole feedback cycle? Would you like to answer that? Slight and thick. The first, hmm? Go, go the, for it. The first, first feedback loop, yeah. I remember that uh, a couple of years ago when I was working in the bank, it was the same. I just took my laptop and went to the developers, like, just show me how you do it, show me why you don't do this. Like, we started to, um, I started to talk with devs, but later on, I started to do some sort of brown bag sessions within the company, like open, uh, open ended, like um, come and talk with us, ask us any questions. Here is the new capability of the platform that I want to display. And they started to join it regularly, and then they, they were bringing their questions. And you see actually when the questions are actually coming from some sort of problems that difficulties they are having while interacting with the, um, with the platform. So you start to actually think about how things get better. But honestly, what I did was just starting the conversation with them. There are a couple of practice help you to um, facilitate these conversations, either virtually or or face to face, that we can maybe um, Point, point out to it. We have, a, uh, we have a website called openpracticelibrary.com. By we, I mean it's the community website. Is um, It has all these kind of practices about discovering the work you need to do um, and some sort of delivery practices and some good foundational practices. There are a couple of UX practices as well there that might be help you to have this kind of conversation as well. Openpracticelibrary.com. Awesome. Thank you. What was the... Um number one thing that you went into it thinking that would happen that was different when you came out? There's the biggest misconception. Mm. Oh, there are biggest from, from which perspective? You can Say again? From which perspective? Just w when you had the idea of what you were going to build and then hearing the feedback and seeing people ah. use it and iterating that came out that was completely different than what you thought. Mm. Let's see. What? I think it was like we had some uh, we always start with some sort of opinionated approach when to, when to do GitOps. So we started putting it uh, in, like, with platform developers, we sort of come up with a good way of, um, a good way of practice GitOps for us. And it was just like the talk that before us showing that, like, you have this uh, application repository and you have a GitOps repository for, like, the overwrite values for the different values per environment. And one of the developers just say that I keep forgetting about this repository. Like, can I have these different values in my own repo? So is that possible, or or just um, or it's just all? And we were like, okay, that's another maybe thing that we can provide, but it needs to some discussion before platform teams. Like, we want do we want to really um, cover this edge case, or is it something that we can say, okay, you can do it this way, but we don't really provide it out of the box in here? So we started the discussion, and we realized actually. What this developer suggested was really a bit of common thing before, uh, between all the developers. So we sort of uh, created another approach for GitOps by supporting the uh, different values file in Helm inside the application repository. So that was something. But Thank you. Okay. Hi. Um, Hi. I'm interested in, you kind of mentioned that you uh, expose like, uh, various infrastructure tools as Lego blocks the uh, Lego blocks that engineers can sort of plug together how they want. Um, quite a lot of these tools are quite sort of low level and very like highly, they're, they're kind of configuration over convention. Um, and I'm kind of interested in what your sort of philosophy is around creating more opinionated higher level tools 
on top of those lower level components to expose to users of the platform. Because um, yeah, I just, I just worry that like exposing all of those things puts a lot of um, responsibility on developers to like understand them deeply and use them correctly. Yeah, what we started to do is like we give some like ready to use templates, let's say. Like you don't have to understand Helm or you don't have to understand GitOps all. You just need to clone these templates, just um, change the name, let's uh, put your application name, and uh, just it would just work. But if you want to know more, here are the uh, here are all the, uh, the explanations of this. Here are the documentations, and here are the sessions that we are always doing. We have uh, an enabling team concept in companies. When uh, when we interact with companies, we always look for build an enabling team so that that team goes and work with these teams to enable them to have them understand more. But not like like you said, like the, in, not in the deep deep level, but just understand that so that they can consume these templates. And if they want to learn more, it's out there. And some, someone eventually comes and learn more and even starts contributing. So we um, look for like easy to um, easy to use blogs. Like just copy this one; it will work. It will just build, bake, deploy your application. But if you want to get to know, like get to know more, or just come to us. Here is our room, or join our brown bag sessions. Write us Slack. We always give this kind of um, guidance to developers too, so that they can learn more if they want to learn more. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? Although those were great questions, really. <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.